Professor, yeah. when are you finishing the grades for Project 1? Uh, hopefully Monday. I'll bring it to the Okay, thank you. Uh, professor, yeah. what are the rules for midterm 1? Like, do we have any resources during the midterm or restrictions during it? Um, like Google? Resources. So, midterm will be very similar to quizzes. Mm -hmm. Like, the type of question. I'm not going to ask you to do live coding at all. Um, it will be multiple choices, true and false. Very similar to your quizzes. Everything will be from the slides, so nothing from the textbook, nothing from like out of the what I already talked about. Uh, that's about it. Open note, open slides, open, not open internet though, not open chat GPT. <laughs> but everything from the slides you can refer back to if you forget something. But it will be time limited, meaning that you won't be able to like spend your time and look up every single question and answer. If you like also and forget something, you can always refer back to the slides. So that's going to be midterm. Um, we'll talk about, I think, during the midterm, there will be, there will be like, during the midterm, there will be, um, but before the midterm, there will be a uh, class. So we will talk about the class, and then when we finish that, we'll start the midterm all together. I'll release it here so you will be able to easily use your laptop or computer here. You can log in. I'll be here if you have any trouble logging in. It's time limited. But that's midterm. Uh, but I don't think midterm will be a couple more weeks. It'll be week nine, I think. According to this, it's March it says next nine. week. Wait, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, March nine. Exists in your code 
So it will go to that part of code and run that part of your code. Which is different than you go to memory, you find the address, get the value, that's different. And does it have address or not like only memory is that because that is how a computer know where to find where those. To find those yeah, but for your uh, for your function, it goes yeah. inside the function. Thanks. 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 All right. Um, unless you want to show me yields function overloading, we talked about this last time. Oh, let me stop light here. Function overloading, where you can trigger the function with different types of parameter, or you have a function with different numbers of parameter, they can share the same name, right? So we talked about this example where there's a sum that you can sum of integer, you can sum of bubble, you can sum of float. And where you when you trigger it, you trigger it with integer or flow or double or float. Right, as simple as that. So your computer, your compiler can refer and be like, oh, okay, this is the function you're triggering. However, for this example, the contents of the functions are exactly the same. So what you are doing is basically copying and pasting your code at different places or duplicating your code at different places, right? We do not like that because we want to have what we call dry code. Dry stands for do not repeat yourself. Um, this is also a very good practice for uh, programmers where you, you, you want to avoid writing duplicated codes. You want to use templating when it's possible, so we're going to show you when you can use templating. Templates are what you use as a placeholder for types and types only. So you can only template types. And the way that we template, because we have placeholder for types, meaning that you need to have the following three, which is functions have the same number of parameters, functions have the same code, and functions have the same type pattern. What does that mean? So look at our example, all of our functions sum have same number of parameters too, right? They have two parameters, all of them do. They share the same code block, exactly the same, right? And they have the same type pattern, meaning that if you want to have a template for int, you have int, int, and int. If you have the template, if be double, you have double, 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 and if you have the template to be float, you have float, float, float. That is what we call template, because the way you do templating is by replacing it with T for a letter. We normally use single letter, we normally use capitalized letter. The way that you tell your compiler that this is a placeholder is just at the beginning of your functions, you do template type name T. You can also do template class T equivalent. Completely equivalent. We're, we haven't talked about classes yet. We'll talk about it after midterm. Um, but you, then you will see in C++, types and class are all the same in C++. So therefore, you could have class T, you can have type T, all the same. So whatever you use is fine. That line tells your compiler this function is templating, meaning that I don't restrict the type. This is the placeholder. Right, for my type, whatever that is. So I have the type T for return, I have type T for the first parameter, I have the type T for the second parameter. Okay, so that is a templated function. When you call this function, you do it exactly the same. You do some 10 and 5, your compiler will know, oh, we're calling a function sum with an integer and an integer. Then it will first, so before it goes that, it will first try to find whether you have a definition of a function sum that takes two integers. And we don't, right? We don't, we don't have that. Then it will try to see whether they can have a templated function of type t equivalent to it. So if we do that, 
let's see whether it works. It will try to generate this piece of code in your compilable image when it's compiled. So it will try to generate that and be like, okay, so if t is integer, meaning that this part is equivalent to this, right? So replace t with n, we get this. Now, we call some 10 and 5 to this function. Will that work? Yes, it will work. That will return 15. Success. And then it will do the same thing. So this is that OBO we just talked about. It will do the same thing for the second time we call it. Be like, okay, now you're doing some double and double. I do not have a function that sum has double and double as parameters. However, I can have a temporary type of t equals to double. Does that work? Yes, it works. That part is generated. Similarly to float. Okay? So you see that as programmer, we just write those four lines. Five lines, five lines, right? Your computer, your compiler will generate 15 lines for us. They probably will not have 15 lines. They probably will have one line, right? When it's generated, it will merge everything together because it's so short. But those are all gonna be generated and then inserted into your image, the compilable image that will be used to execute your code, okay? Any question on this? Yes. So basically, this is equal to the same as uh, what the overloading does, but it's just a syntactic sugar. I'll try to show you the difference. Overloading is more powerful than that. But yes, yeah, so for the one that we overloaded for some, we can replace it completely with templating. Yes. For that example, yes. But with less code, right? You have dry code now, right? Nothing is good. Can I have multiple placeholders? Yes. T is the most common temporary type. U is the second most common temporary type. And when we have type in T, type in U, you can then have something like this. When you have T, T, U, that is your pattern. Meaning that whatever the first type of, first parameter type is, it will be the return. Right, because it's T, T is the first parameter type. So let's see how it works. If I do 3.5, this is a flow, right? Or double, yeah, double flow, this is actually flow. This is an integer. We're gonna try to have t equal to double, u equal to int. It's gonna generate that. It will return 4.5, right? Now, if I just change this one single letter to u. That's all I'm gonna change, everything is all the same. If I just change that to you, your result's gonna be different. Because your type pattern is reversed. You're saying that the type I'm gonna return is equivalent as the second parameter type, which is an integer. So when you do 3.5 plus one, it will actually return you four, not 4.5. So the patterns really matter on the function that you're trying to write. Yeah, any question on that? Yes. Oh, yes. Can we restrict it, um, this, the template that you actually uh, implemented, can we restrict it to not to accept it, a certain type? Oh, not a certain type? You cannot. As long as the type pattern is the same, the, yeah, the type pattern is the same, it will go through. So what if we actually, so the first parameter is a type of integer and the second is string? Then it will try to return a string and give you, a, it give you an error. An error. Actually, yeah, because you're basically the arrow will be, however, that you're trying to add a number and a string. It will not be like you have a wrong template function. You don't. It's just your, your implementation inside, like line seven, is not compatible with the function call. So it's no different than you implement a function and you're not calling it correctly. So it's no different than that. So it's uh, the coder's responsibility to actually be careful. Yes, yes, the programmer. Right. So one thing. Oh yes. Question. What if you have the same example where you pass an int and a double, but instead of having just instead of having both type name T and type name U, you only have one. Like for example, just type name T. Does it throw an error? Wait say that again. So I have type T and U. What, what, what you, well, so like in, in this example, you have type T and U, but what if you only had type T and you use type T the whole way through, but you had in your um, parameters uh, uh, an int and a double? 
and would that result in an error? No, it won't, right? It's the same as the previous example. It, it still just give you an in? Sorry, I'm confused. So are you talking about something like this? This? Where you have just one type? T? No, if you put two types in the parameter for when you call the function, so mm -hmm. like some int and float. Oh, right? you cast it into int, you don't do T and U? Yeah, it will just give you four. No, so, no, 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 I'm saying, so for example, like some 10.2 comma 5, but both of my, th th that's a float and an int, but both of my type names are T, so it's, I only have one letter for type name. Oh, that it will be function undefined. Okay. Because it couldn't find it, right? Um, so one thing that we'll, which I was going to talk about, is that even though when you have, so if you have T and U, right, and then if you have A plus B, does not mean that T and U have to be different. So you can have int, 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 that will still run, right? So if I have string, 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 that will still run. But if you have, let's see, what will not run? Um, yeah, I think the example, that string int, right, that, that will work. Um, so T and U saying that they can be different, and then the return type match the second one, that's it. That's all that is saying. It doesn't say that they have to be different or this have to be integer. No, nothing like that. Okay? Okay. Alright. Now we talked about just using template type. How about we mix it? It's completely fine mixing. Most of the time we mix it. Right? Where you have template type T, you also have defined type integer, for example. Meaning that the second parameter will always be integer. Inside your function definition, you can use T as any other type, as any type. Right? So you can have T. You can use T to define a new local variable to the function to completely fine. This type will be the same as the first parameter. It will be the same as the return type. That's the restriction for this. Yeah, so before we find to mix it, you can actually see that when you uh, We're calling duplicate three times with three different types. We have a string, we have an integer, we have a double. We're calling a string, integer, and a double. Right? For this duplicate. The second parameter always an integer, so we're just going to put three there. Meaning that when you call this function, the t should be an int and a string and a double corresponding, right? So you can, oh, what do you want? So we should like that. Oh, two seconds. All right. So we're here, where we have. Oh yeah, those are local. We have an integer five. 1.25 will have a string that's not showing up for some reason. Um, but when I go in, step into here, why doesn't this type on your computer? It should show the type. Oh, it does. So 
will show you the value, it will show you the type. There is a string length apparently, which is good, we're not going to use that. But this is basically what your output is. If I do it again, over, step out, step into the next function, now it's integer, right? So go in, it's in. So you can see it. Step out. Next step. This is going to be double. Go in. Double. Right? Step out. Then I return. Right? Alright. High cost. So someone asked, like, can I restrict the type that's been passing? You cannot. However, you can define a special use case for the type. For example, here, we're going to call sum. We're going to call sum. We're going to pass it 3.5 and 1. But I'm going to tell the compiler I'm passing in two doubles. One is a legit double. Right, it's 1.0000, right, it's a double. 3.5 is a double. This will work. Once we do that, remember before when we have u as the return type, this will return 4, right? When we do that, it will return 4. Right? So you can, what we call casting, type casting. It's telling your compiler what you want to type. All right. Now let's look at something called type reference. So we talk about reference, we talk about template T. Can we use T with reference or with pointer and things? Yes, you can. So this is an example where you're using reference with type T to show you that T is just no different than int, no different than float or string or double or whatever type you use. Just use that the same as you use any other type. It's going to work fine. So here, I'm going to implement something called swap with a passive A and B, right? Same type, right? Both P. I'm going to create a temp inside my local function swap. I'm going to use temp as my first holder to replace the value between A and B. All right, so on that base your memory, type is T, variable name is A, type is T, variable name is B. This is my local type T variable names temp. Meaning that, say that I have a, one and two in A and B, I'm gonna first assign the value A to temp. That's gonna be holding one. Swap it, replace it back, done. Okay, why do I do this? So that I can directly change A and B without return. That's the benefit of pass by reference, right? You directly modify it um, in that region. With just this six lines, nope, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines, you basically have implemented all the possible types that you want to do. For example, I can do integer, I can do swap for them, I can do float, I can swap for them, and I can do char, right, for string, you can swap for them as well. Right? One thing that I do want to mention is that if you haven't triggered a type, for example, here we have int, float, and char. We didn't have double, we didn't have long, we don't have any of that, right? There's not going to be a part of the code for a double generator. No. Only because we called int, float, and char, that is when your compiler will generate that code for you based on the template function and put it in your code so that you can use it. So it will not generate every single type, right? It will only generate the ones that you need to use. So that was all about template A. Now let's look at the difference between function overloading and template, which was something that we learned last week. We talked about the rules when you can use template, right? You need to have the same number of parameters, same number of code block, uh, same code block, same type patterns. That is when you can use template. For function overloading, 
all that you need is the same name. That's all, right? You do need to make sure they have differences, right? You can't implement the same name, same types, same return multiple times. That is not, that's going to be a uh, constant error. But if you have different function, different parameters, different number of parameters, different type of parameter, no matter what your code block is, no matter whether you have the same type pattern, they don't matter, you can always use function overloading as long as you want them to have the same function name. Okay, so function overloading is a lot more flexible. Templating has restriction because they have to be able to template the type, right? They don't have the same type pattern, you cannot do that. They definitely share the same code block, you write it once, um, and they definitely share the same parameters. So it's more limited. So here's an example. Say that I have the same number of parameter, same type pattern, but when I am adding two strings together, I want a space. Most of them, you look like regular, okay, I can template like this. The minute you look at implementation, you cannot template. Okay? And most of the function overloading do not share the same code block. They have very different. Okay. Most of the functions that share the same code blocks, they most likely have the same type pattern as well. So when you're looking at a function, if their implementation are exactly the same, you probably want to think about templating first, right? Like, oh, like this looks like something I can template out. If you don't have the same code blocks, it's out of the question. Like, there's no way you can template this because they're not the same function. Yeah. Any questions? We're done with templating. Okay, so that was all about templates. Now, I do want to share with you something that C++ is really good at, in addition to C, is providing you this very rich standard template library. A lot of the things in there are templated so that you can use it for whatever types you want. Inside the SEL, standard template library, in C++, there are four main categories of functions as defined. Functions and library that are defined for you. Algorithms, containers, functions, iterator. We will only talk about functions today. We will share with you some of the algorithms that you can use when you're implementing your functions. Containers, you will learn to use that in data structure. Iterators. We will learn that in algorithm classes, I think. Yeah. All right. So let's focus on the algorithms. The library is called algorithm. You just include that. Within that, the things I want to share with you are manipulator for arrays. So every time we work with an array, ever since um, we talk about SEL. You probably have a loop, you have a while loop, you have a loop. You handle the element one at a time. When you input, when you include algorithm library, you don't really need to do that. A lot of the functionality to work with array um, is already provided in the algorithm library. Very useful one for this one is sorting, right? When you want to sort an array, or when you want to sort a portion, of an array, you can do that using sort. So this is our example of how you can use sort, where I have an array, okay, and I get the size, where we talk about how to get the size. Um, when you do sort, you pass in the front of array, you pass in the end, the front of the sort, the end of the sort. For me, this is the head of the array, you just put it at one, this is the last one at the array because when you do array plus array size, it will shift it all the way to here, right? So I'm sorting everything. You don't have to. You can be like, okay, I'm gonna sort array and then array plus five. Then it will sort one, two, three, four, five. It will just sort this portion. 
We can also sort from array plus two, which would be here, here, and then to array plus eight. So we'll do this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So you'll only sort those and keep the first two and the last two the same. You can sort whichever segment that you want, but have to be one segment. You cannot be like, I want to sort the first three and the last three. Like, no. Okay? Um, why are we not putting the index? Yes, so sort, check it out, um, taking pointers. So what this is saying is that for every single array, we kind of talk about the array manager, uh, memory manager, right? You have a memory like this in your computer, and then you may have integers stored here, float here, I don't know, like uh, a double here, and then your array. And then your array start with one, five, eight, nine, six, and so on, right? So for every single array, it actually is a pointer pointing to, is it AR? Yes, pointing to what we call the head of an array. If you say plus five, it's going to shift this pointer to one, two, three, four, five. That's what you pass it. So that's why the plus here, whatever that goes. Yeah, plus. Okay. So that's what the store is thinking. Everything in the algorithms probably do it with pointers for um, the most part. If you say, oh, I want a raise zero. This is one single value that we want. How do you sort a number, right? If you think, I'm going to sort array 1 and array 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, array 4, right? That's another value. They say nothing about what's in between. Like you would think that, hey, I'm telling you array 0 and telling you array 4. You should figure it out. It cannot. It really cannot, right? They really need to work on the pointer so you know that, oh, this is the starting point. Plus five is here, it's the ending point. I'm sorting everything from array, array plus one, array plus two, array plus three, four, and five. This is one single value that's not going to be helpful for segmenting. Similarly for reverse, right? When you have a reverse, you also pass in where you want to reserve, uh, which at which starting point you want to start reversing, and which ending point you want to start reversing. Any segment is fine, right? It could be at the beginning to the end, it could be from the second to the last, of the second last. Any segment is fine, right? Just pass in where you want to start, where you want to end. Yeah. Okay, this is an example that you can try. This is showing where I'm reverting a portion of my, of my array. So you can see that if I just put plus five, right? Be like, only reverse the first five. So this is after it's sorted. This is after it's reversed. So you only reserve, reverse this first and keep the rest the same. Okay, so any segment. Counting, also very helpful. This is helping you to count the numbers of this element within this range. Okay, so for this one, it's counting how many zeros is between the beginning of the array and the end of the array. Yes. This one is saying counting, please count how many ones inside the beginning of the array until the end of the array. This is again a segment, doesn't have to be the whole array, you can just segment it out however you want. This is the number you're trying to have a count. So if this is a string array, you need to put a string here. Find how many strings in this string array. Okay, so that's calculated. Most importantly, copy n. You do not need to write loops to copy and you will be using this in your project where I don't want you 
to have a long array and be like 4, i equal to 0, i plus 1, i less than whatever the size, i plus 1. And then do, this is array, this is another array, one at a time. Don't do that anymore, right? You just need to have your target, uh, your source array, where you're copying from, your target array, where you're copying into, how many you wanted to copy. That's it. All right, once you do that, you have an array, you have a copy of the array. Very important to understand the copy because in uh, high level language, including C++, Java, Python, C Sharp, like all of those, there's a difference between shallow copy and deep copy. So, shallow copy does not really make a copy. It will make it an alias, it will make it like a name, like a reference, right? So say that this is my array, if, and this is not just C++, okay, applicable to most of the programming language. If you're doing what we call a shallow copy, then you're be that, okay, this is array, and this is also, is that our name? Yeah, this is also, I'm writing too small, this is also array copy. Point to here as well. If you change this, both of them will be changed, which is not ideal. Most likely, when people create a copy, they want them to actually be separate copy. Deep copy, meaning that I'm going to create copy of 1, 5, 8, 9, 6. That's copy copy. This concept is applicable to almost all programming languages. Okay? So when we are saying copy and this is deep copy, we're literally making a copy of that that can take twice of your memory. All right? Cool. That's our for templating. Um, the most important thing is that to distinguish the difference between templating and overload, right? Because we've done both now. They're pretty similar. Um, and another thing is STL. I'm just showing you a small, like four functions of STL. But if you just search on Google to do it, I'm gonna be like, oh, an algorithm to, I uh, don't know, like um, randomize an array, for example. Like there's gonna be something there, right? It's a huge library that people have contributed into to make your life easier. Um, but for this class, please only use the one that I taught. Um, otherwise, the program that I'm expecting, you will just be finished in, in 10 lines or something, right? So only use the one that I have shown on the slides to finish your projects. All right, thank you for the reminder. That's end of the, the first half of this class. So next week, we're gonna start talking, talk, start talking about classes. Classes, we're gonna spend three weeks, meaning that's six lectures on it, just to just to talk about the concept of a class. What is a class? That's the most important concept of object-oriented programming, which I guarantee that's gonna be very important for any of your interviews. They're gonna ask you something about object-oriented programming. They will just ask you, do you do for object-oriented programming? Don't be like, what's object-oriented programming? Okay, not helpful. So classes is the fundamental concept of an object, okay? Meaning, the class is going to start to become very hard in a very short amount of time. To help you with that, the bad thing is, though, if you look at the slides, they're all really short. Right? Be like, because I'm going to spend a, a single lecture to talk about one concept and one concept only, because everything after that depends on that, and so on. So like, we spend six lectures on classes. Everything after that. It's based on your understanding of classes, okay? So if you be like, oh, like three weeks from now, I still don't know what's class, please come to me, right? Because the class, the, the, the lecture after that, it's gonna be like, okay, how am I gonna use all the property of class? Right? If you go look at my review of classes, it's super long, the summary, like the one that we just like, really short and sweet, it's like super long, right? That's the fundamental of this. That's why people come and be like, why is it project three so much harder than project two? And why is it project four so much harder than project three? 
is because we are going into object-oriented programming where the core concept of C++. Ever since till now, even templating, it's pretty generic, right? Like, you have templating for other programming languages as well. You have functions, you have to use in C. Classes is what enables C++ to be C++, to be something that's so powerful. So yeah, so you will see starting from classes, every time I talk about new concepts, I'll do a review, right? I'll spend like a lot of time doing like, previously from last week, we talked about this, right? And then I'll talk about new concepts because they're closely related. You have to understand that before you advance into the next one. And my talking speed will also slow down, okay? You will see that. Because I will ask repeatedly, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Before we get to that, hope you enjoy the first half. Let's have a fun project uh, to conclude the first half of the semester. So this one I'm going to ask you to implement is a uh, data processing system. So the background story is here. We're going to base on this animated character called Diva, and we're going to play this game, if I can. Welcome to another episode of Shooting Star. Today, we set our sights on Guza, home of the eSports champion turned ace pilot, Diva. I'm going to win. At just 19, she'd become a national hero. Only last week, she risked her life again, defending the city from the Kishin Olympics. She and the Mecha Squad took a few hits, but they pulled off another victory. Now, Diva is celebrating with some hard-earned glitz and glamour. <laughs> hey, Hana, shouldn't you be out signing autographs or something? Hottest spots in the city, eating the finest boots, then hanging out with other superstars. Well, life wasn't always like this. I wonder what glitz and glamour tastes like. Why are we on leave with the rest of the squad? I could use a little glitz and glamour in my life, you know? It's overrated, Taehyun. This, this is where the magic happens. It's like how we used to stay up late and work on your hover bike. <laughs> you mean the one you wrecked? Really? You're still mad about that? We won the race. Yeah, and you almost killed yourself. Enjoy! <sighs> you beat the Kishin. They won't be back for months. You need a break. Oh, I can't I can't. I can't. Uh, Hannah? We barely won last time. The enemy is out there, adapting and getting stronger. The rest of the squad, the country, they're all counting on me. If I make a mistake and the Kishin get through us, we lose everything. I, uh... I need to finish the task. Stop putting it all on yourself. It's okay to ask for help. I've got this. Really? <sighs> Command says we're in the clear, but hey, what the... That can't be right. It's too soon. <laughs>
and wait for reinforcements. It will get here in time.
I will feed your program combat.txt with different concepts, with different content. Okay? The combat.txt is a file that uh, contains three lines. The first one is how many enemies, uh, so there are two types of enemies, right? The one that's the smaller one that you can shoot with micro-missile, and then the final boss, the big one, that you have to explore to defeat. So the first number is telling you how many smaller bots that is coming to attack the city. If I say five, it means that there will be five integers at the beginning of the second line, those will be the damages that damage those uh, bots can kind of damage the, okay, the damage that they can give. Followed by a bigger number, to say float, to indicate what's the damage the final box can generate. All right? So if I have 10 here, there will be 10 integers before a float. And it will always end with one single float. Okay? The third line is the default setting for Diva, meaning that before we know anything about the combat, Diva by default will be loaded with 10 micro missiles, and the defense matrix can default, by default absorb 100 damage. That's by default. You need to figure out whether that's enough, right? Depends on the first two lines. You're gonna tell you're gonna tell Diva whether she need to have more micro missiles or she need a stronger defense matrix, right? So first thing is you read that file, and here are the detail of how you're gonna read it. Here are all the variable names. Make sure you use those because my grader will go look for it. All right, I'm gonna look for those variables to make sure you implemented them correctly with the correct type. Um, so that is the variable you store all the information that you need from the file. Include boss count, right, that's the first number, boss power and the rate, there we go. Boss power will be a float, that will be that. Micro missile, that will be that. And defense matrix will be that. Okay? Pretty straightforward for reading. So once you have run it in, you have everything you need to start a calculation. The first thing I'm going to do is to calculate defense matrix. Okay, so let's see whether Diva has enough to absorb all the damage the enemies can make to her. Um, and you will want to have a function called matrix power to calculate how much power the matrix needs to have. This is, these are the uh, parameters this function will take, this is what it will return. You need to figure out how to calculate it. Okay? The second function, summary, is how to calculate how many micro missiles she will need. The function name. Again, please make sure you match all the bold and blue text, right? That will be your function name. I'll go look for that. Here are some data on how you calculate it. There's some condition, right? For example, if the argument is less than 15, they will return two times that. If the argument is greater than 15, it will return five times that. Some data of how you would calculate that. You implement that. Um, and then this function, should be able to take in two types. The one that we pass in for the integer from the box, and the one that we have, which is going to be a float from the box. Okay? Because the implementation is shared, you will have a templated function. So this is a templated function. Once you have those ready inside the main, you can implement logic to call them, right? Matrix power is pretty simple. You just call the matrix power that should return to you how much matrix power is required. Make sure you have this variable in that name. Now you also need to calculate the missile power. That's a little bit different than the matrix power. You just call the function um, because you need to have a loop to calculate 
the power needed for every single box and also the box. And then put them all, add them all together. That is how much micro missile you need to defeat all of them. Right? So you do that in main. And I say here is the sum of all the term values. So there's some details. Example of how that would be calculated. And that at the end of this session, you have uh, matrix power required for the combat and also the micro missiles required for the combat. Now I just need to check whether Diva has enough by default, right? Do we have the default? Uh, and we want you to have load Diva function that takes in two parameters. One is going to be loading defense matrix. The other one is going to be loading micro missiles. Both of those functions will be called load Diva. Because defense matrix and micro missile loadings are so different, it's going to be two different functions. Same name, overloading. Okay. So for this, the first one is how you will load defense matrix. Make sure that so no divas will be a void function. Okay. Meaning that you don't return any value. If you want to modify divas, micro missile, and defense matrix, you have to pass in by reference. So I have mark here. Make sure you pass in by reference. And then you pass what's currently in Diva, what's needed, and then you implement some logic to see whether you need to upgrade that or whether you keep the same. One thing to note, for both of the load function, you don't want to subtract from Diva's load. If Diva has more than enough, leave her be, right? If Diva doesn't have enough, please give her more. Okay, so those implementations are going to be there. Similarly in here, because micro-missiles are number of missiles, right? You have the power that you need from the micro-missile. So you need to convert it into how many missiles does that mean? Does that mean? Um, so this is the algorithm to, this is where you implement that. You calculate how many missiles is needed for that much power. There's some calculation, you divide it by 60 and you round up. Make sure you round up, right? You don't want to round down, otherwise you will only be able to be a portion of the enemy. So make sure you always round up, and you can use this function seal, seal it, from cmap to do that. So you do that, and then you load it. Make sure both of the functions have passed by reference only for the ones that's needed. Don't just be like, oh, pass by reference. I'm going to pass everything by reference. Don't do that. And okay? only pass the one that's um, after that, load diva function, you just trigger it, also pretty straightforward. Report. After you have everything you need, you're going to write generate a report to tell diva that she's ready. Start with the header, diva's combat report. Combat with. This is a variable that you read. It could be 5, it could be 8, it could be 10, depends on the combat.txt I passed to your program. Power, again, read from the file, depends on what that power is. And here is your calculated result. So I want Diva to be loaded with, if you have, if 10 is not enough, this would be probably like 15 or 12 or 18. This should never be something less than 10. All right, so I'm down here. This should only be a number that's greater than 100. So that's the default. We don't want to subtract from it, so this number should never be smaller than 100. Okay. And then we're ready for combat. Do not need to submit your report.txt. Because I'll be fitting your program with different combat.txt, those will be generated um, when I bring it. Okay. So you just need to submit one single C++ file. Okay. Make sure you only use what's been covered so far. Okay. Use functions, use temporary function, overloading function. Don't use anything I have not covered yet. My grader will not take them. I'm going to start going through the slides now. So if you feel comfortable starting this, I'll see you next week. We'll start class next week first, and then we'll go into meet them. We'll look, so is it going to be like one question at a time, and you have to click next in order to see the next question, or can we just see all the questions at once? You should be able to see all questions. Oh. I think. I'll Thank you. 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 Thank you.
skin uh, however you would like. Um, and you use that inside your function to write a loop. You should have everything you need to write a loop. You have the number of bars to control how many times your loop is going to run. You use that to sum up everything inside the array, which is also passive. Make sure at the end you add the float on top. Okay? That is why this function will return a float. Inside main, you simply call this function. Your main will probably look very similar to this, but you can have different order if you want. Not All right? So that calculates how much ma uh, matrix power is needed for Diva. Then the next one is how many single uh, micro missiles needed for Diva. The function that you need to, do, uh, to use is this template function of single missile power that will take in one integer, it could be either an, uh, one parameter, it could be either an integer or a float. Alright? So you take that of template type T or U, whatever you want to name that, check the parameter value. And then you see what there's the detail of the calculation is in the um, in the description. You calculate the return value based on the condition and return it directly. Because of the template function, make sure you have the right type pattern where the return type is the same as parameter type. So if you have the parameter type T you should have the return type T. Okay? Once you have that, you use that to calculate one enemy at a time. So for here, because we have multiple bots, and you see that here I am putting in one single index, is that because it's going to take one number at a time, I'm going to have a loop to loop through my array of the box power and then call this function over and over again inside of Yeah? Once you have that, you sum them up and that value, you can store it in the power required. Make sure at the end you also pass in the boss power, which is a blue. If you have this templated correctly, this will return a float as well. If you don't have the correct type templates, you may miss it by a decimal point. Okay, so if you be like, oh, I got almost the correct answer because I have example output provided in the project assignment, check your type. Most likely, there's some type that you have wrong. Okay, that will cause a like, slight difference between your uh, your answer All right? All right, function overloading for low diva. Two types, two functions of loading diva. One is going to load defense matrix, one is used to load micro missiles. Make sure that you are taking the defense matrix and the micro missiles by reference, meaning that for this low diva, both of the implementation of low diva have the first parameter as reference. I mean, not necessarily first. If you have this as a second, then second parameter as a reference. But only that. The other one, which is power required, either major power required or missile power required, is passing by back. We don't need to directly modify that. It should not be passing by reference. Only the one that you will change, which is defense matrix or micro missile, those pass in by reference. Inside the low diva function, um, you want to check whether you need to load. There's a possibility that you do not need to load. And for the first one, you simply check the condition and see whether 
the required power is more than what's already what what Diva has right now. Okay. Check it against this variable. If it's yes, replace it, right? Meaning add more. If it's no, don't reduce it. Just leave it be. Okay? Leave it as the default. For micro missile, it's a little bit different because first you need to calculate how many missiles we need for this much power, right? So the calculation is also in the project assignment. I think it's divided by 60 and then round up. You calculate that, that will tell you how many micro missiles has to be an integer, right? We do not load three and a half micro missiles, right? We always load integers to the micro missile. Once you have that number, use that number to increment the rest. Use that number to check if segment, whether this is more than enough, or whether we need more. Replace with that value, right? A lot of people will forget that, oh, we have calculated this. They will just pass in this float for the if statement. They'll replace it with a float. Um, it's not going to be correct, okay? Once you calculate how many missiles in that function, use that integer for the rest of the function. Okay, use that integer. All right. Finally, um, here's the, an example of how you can write a report. For this, I recommend you to use OF screen because that way you don't need a mode. You can just associate it with your report.txt. Make sure you check file open again. This is different from the read file. You need to check it again before you write. Once you make sure that it is okay, then you write to file, and this is an example of how you could do this. Close file when done, very important. And then return it. That's the end of the project. All right, any questions? So the size uploaded on uh, Canvas, so we can download it. Um, you can see that I tried to give you a lot of detail about how to implement it. Does not mean that you cannot do otherwise, right? When I say for loop, it's just because I really like for loop. You don't have to. If you like while loop, use while loop. All that you need to keep consistent are the variable names, the function names, because that's what I'm going to be looking for. As long as you calculate them correctly, you're fine. So just one tiny question. Oh, the line that actually says if yes, or if the uh, defense matrix. No, let's go back to the previous page. Go back? Yeah, to the previous page. Where you, where you were actually... Uh, where? Uh, if you, yeah. Oh, if yes, yeah. Right. So um, for, the, for the line that says if yes, or if, um, if check to see whether the power required is more on a defense matrix. So my question is about otherwise leave it as is. So, so well, if you're just checking to see if it's uh, if the uh, if the defense matrix is actually um, larger than oh yeah, larger than yeah, don't do it. You can you can even just not no, write an else. No. You don't need an else for every single thing. Okay, so I'll, okay, I see. What Right? Like, right, right? If you want an else to make it look nice from the code readability perspective, mm -hmm. you can do else return. Yes. Return control, basically. Right? Because this comment is going to return a value. You can be like else return. Or you just don't have an else statement, mm -hmm. meaning that that if statement will be skipped, which is perfect because we don't want it to do anything um, when the if statement shows. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So either way is fine. But yeah, so I do try to give you some flexibility still. Be an engineer. <laughs> but at least if you are confused on how to implement it, this will give you an outline of like how you can follow this. But yeah, you can do this part when you like um, else statement or just don't do it. I mean, I was, I was thinking about using a, a, a not operator and then just a switch. Like for example, I'm checking, uh, I'm checking for the opposite of the, the comparison that you were recommending those, uh -huh. but in that case, I'm going to have to add an else. Yeah, don't do the, 
the you don't need a not if you it's greater than or smaller than question, right? Mm. Greater than, but not greater than is smaller than. Who's smaller yeah, than? Yeah. Right. So don't do I'm overthinking. Don't do the yeah, don't do the not smaller than because that will decrease the visibility, decrease the mechanicality, like make it more complicated than it needs to. So we wanted to we want to keep it simple.